Liverpool's former status as the second city of the British Empire has left it with an unbeatable medley of magnificent buildings. Its economic prosperity gave it one of the finest set of civic buildings anywhere in the world and a legacy of monumental workplaces, docks and warehouses, banks and offices, tunnels and ventilators. We have also inherited an impressive array of more domestic buildings, private houses, schools, libraries, churches and hotels. In this series we hope to tell the story of some of those buildings, some great, much loved and full of history, some more mundane, some newer and as yet less well liked. Join us as we walk the streets of Liverpool. My name is Angela and I'm your RIBA Liverpool City Tour Guide today. We're beginning at one of my favourite buildings of all the architectural gems in Liverpool. I like it because it's wonderful architecture but it surrounds world-class engineering. This is George's Dock Ventilation Tower. It was finished in 1931 as part of the Queensway Merseyside Tunnel, which was officially opened in 1934. This is George's Dock Ventilation Tower. It's a Grade 1 listed building based in White Portland Stone. The architect was Herbert J. Rouse. Now, he had designed other buildings in Liverpool, but more in the classical style. For this one, he decided on an Art Deco design. Art Deco refers back to ancient Egypt, but it also refers forward to the motor time, where people were moving quicker, there was speed. So if we look at the very top of the building, where the shaft is, you, it does resemble a pylon from ancient Egypt and like the pylons in ancient Egypt it's also covered in sculpture, relief and decoration. And this is because Herbert J. Rouse worked alongside two other sculptures. One was Edmund C. Thompson and he was helped by George T. Capstick and the three of them together designed this wonderful building. And you can see at the very, very top where you have those Egyptian type reliefs. In the middle, you have a relief that represents ventilation. It's got lots of little zigzag lines. On either side of that, you have the beautiful, slender, slim line fluted columns. And on the top of the columns, which has got a lovely Liverpool touch, are the live birds, as if they're just coming down to roost on top of those columns. This Art Deco style continues with the frieze going all the way around the building and especially if you look at the corners of the frieze where you get the horses' heads and the manes of the horses are looking like they're speeding along. The reliefs, if I'm going to talk about those now, there are four reliefs all the way around the building. The first one I want you to look at is the one that represents civil engineering and the man in the middle is holding a circle, that represents the Mersey Tunnel. On either side his two supporters are holding pneumatic drills. Now on the other side, the second relief represents construction because of course the civil engineering project couldn't go ahead without the construction workers. And this one again, you have the man with his hair looking like it's all electrified and one of the ladies is holding a trowel to represent construction. From the relief showing the construction, we're now going to go around the corner to look at the construction workers. Right, from here I want to look at this sign, Gory, because although it's probably quite contentious, this idea, I actually like it because what it does, it gives me the idea to talk about something that we try to hide in Liverpool. When we think of lots of place names, you think, well, where do these place names come from? For example, George's Dock Ventilation Tower. Who's George and where's the dock? Nobody seems to question these things. George was King George III. The name of the dock was this area was once a dock, all the way from here down to the Liver Building. It was opened in 1771, named after King George III, and when it was drained, the Three Graces and the Ventilation Tower were put here. Now this is another sign, this says Gory, and it refers to huge warehouses that were in this area. And Gory was the name of an island off the west coast of Africa where the slaves were embarked to go onto their middle passage because of course Liverpool had quite a large part on the slave trade. Now I know some people would like these signs to be taken away and a lot of place names of streets. But it does mean, as a Liverpool tour guide, I'm, I'm able to talk to people about the slave trade and it's not hidden under the carpet. So lest we forget, Mersey Travel, well done for putting that new sign up there to represent Gory. 
to show you the next thing is a plaque to do with the construction workers of the Liverpool Tunnel because of course Queensway Tunnel was not done with any machinery, it was done with many, many construction workers working by hand. And they have finally put a plaque up to those construction workers who died during the making of the tunnel. And there were 17 of these men who did die, but what I want to point out is one of the youngest, who was only 18 years old at the time. If we look at the plaque itself to do with the memorial of those 17 men who died, if we look on the left of the plaque, the third name down, James Herbert Brown. Now, I'd be interested to see if anybody knows about this story or whether they can verify it. He was 18 years old and when he died, the people who worked with him, they wanted to take the day off from working in the tunnel. It was refused and apparently, or allegedly, the whole workforce down tools so they could join in with his funeral. Whether they did that because he was 18, I don't know, but it'd be interesting if anybody can verify that story for us. What I'm looking at here is this very small plaque. It tells you that Herbert J. Rouse worked on this building. He was the architect, but he worked with Edmund C. Thompson and George T. Capstick, the people I call the middle initial men. But it does show that the whole building is because the decorators, the sculptors, and the architects all work together. And that's why I like this building, because it fuses everything together. And you can still see the frieze that's all the way around the building. And now I'm looking at the other two reliefs, the two on the other side, civil engineering and construction. On this side, this one, refers to decoration. So you've got the man in the middle and the two supporters. The two supporters, one has a sculptor's mallet and the other one has an artist's palette to show that the architect works with the decorators as well. Right, from here, I'd like to point out the toll booth because Herbert J. Rouse he was the architect of all the extra parts to the Mersey Tunnel, so the parts that you would see, ventilation shaft, the lampposts, the portals to the tunnel and the toll booths. Now this toll booth is one of the few that's left now and Mersey Travel, well done, have put it back here. It was rescued from Haydock Park where it was where you put the tote on apparently, painted black and white. They've now renovated it and here it is in all its Art Deco glory. And behind it you will see a, a large circular object, that's one of the extra fans to the ventilation shaft that had been put in afterwards. Right, we're now going round to what's the front of the building, it's one of the best parts of the building because of course although it seems like a side road, on the other side on the Strand when this building was put up was the overhead railway so this side had to be the front. Okay, from here you can also look at the fourth relief, this one subject is architecture, you can see the ionic column in the middle and the supporters, one has a set square, one has compasses. So what we've got are the four reliefs to do with the whole fusion of the building, civil engineering, construction, decoration and architecture. And Herbert J. Rouse and all the other people involved worked to get the whole of the ventilation shaft finished in that Art Deco style. So here we are at the front of the building and we've got the beautiful Art Deco style all the way around the doors, the bold geometrical style that was part of the Art Deco design. But also from here I want you to look at my two favourite statues on the front of the building. If we look at this one we have the statue has his eyes closed and in the middle there is a star and this represents night. And on the other side, similar the companion statue, it has its eyes open and in the middle it has a sun, it represents day and that's telling you that this building was open all night and all day. Today we'd probably have some sort of 24-7 logo on the top of the chimney but today, although in the past they did it slightly differently. And 
our last piece on this building is a wonderful piece of sculpture called Speed. Now, it may have some connotations. Herbert J. Rouse apparently had an affiliation or he was fond of Amy Johnson, but it's supposed to be her. And you can see the leather helmet and the pilot's goggles. But it also is half in half, isn't it? You've got half human and half motorized person at the bottom. So there's the wheel, it's on edge over us. And the whole picture is symmetrical as well. You've got the horse's heads, which is from the frieze on the corners as well. And that the whole thing represents speed as in the speed of the Mersey Tunnel. <music> Our second building today, we're going to look at a very contentious site, Man Island at the Pierhead. I'm Pat and I'm another RIBA tour guide and we've just crossed the road from the George's Dock ventilation shaft and we're now standing on Man Island. Man Island is this behind me, three black buildings. But where does the name come from? Why an island and why man? Well this was in the 18th and 19th centuries virtually an island in the middle of docks surrounded by water with just a very short spit of land connecting its island to the city centre. To the north of us there was the George's Dock, to the south and the east the Canning Dock, to our west the River Mersey and just this short spit of land leading us into the city. In the 18th and 19th centuries this island, virtual island, was a busy place. It was covered with warehouses, small factory buildings, was full of action and bustle and people. It got bigger, taller and busier as time went on. It acquired the warehouses of the Great Western Railway. It acquired a station for the overhead railway. It acquired quite tall factory buildings. And then in the 20th century, it became a rather sad and desolate place. Big buildings went and it became a sort of bus terminal there was a car showrooms here for a while and it was in short a fairly desolate area. That's the island part. Now man, well it's a him, a he. John Mann owned businesses here on this island in the 18th century. Originally the island was called Mersey Island but soon because of the extent of his businesses it became Mann's Island and again shortly after that Mann Island. So Mann Island is the street we're standing on. It is also the address of these buildings behind me, these stark, very different black buildings. The area that we're standing in became, in 2004, the very centre of the World Heritage Site. UNESCO had made Liverpool into a World Heritage Site that year. In front of us, we have all sorts of buildings, listed buildings, all to do with Liverpool's maritime heritage. And behind me, the Albert Dock, the largest grade one listed building in the country. And stuck in the middle was this desolation of a street called Man Island with not much on it. So the city decided in the early 2000s that something should be done, that the area should be developed, that there should be an encouragement of people to come down here from the city. There should be an encouragement for people to live here, work here. There should be open spaces, public realms for people to enjoy viewing the buildings here and that this island should be part of the general improvement of the waterfront that was well in hand. Soon the waterfront was going to acquire a new canal link, it was going to acquire a new museum. So Man Island was certainly up for development. The architects whose plan for this island was chosen were 
Broadway Malian, based in the city. The plan that they came up with was approved by CABE, the Commission for Architecture and the Built Environment, and by English Heritage. The city liked it, the city wanted it, and in 2006 planning permission was granted. Building began in 2007. Now the plan that Broadway Malian came up with to satisfy the very diversified demands of the city was a set of three buildings, one that was entirely offices, one that was a mixture of offices and apartments, three new open spaces, we're standing on one of them, making that link to the city more attractive, one internal public space and a further public space behind the buildings on the new, or what would soon be, the new canal side. That was the plan. The major challenge of this plan was that it had to satisfy the requirements of being in the centre of a UNESCO World Heritage Site. In order to satisfy the requirements of being a World Heritage Site, the buildings had to enhance and beautify this area, not detract from it, and to lend, if possible, new and interesting views to the historic buildings already much loved in this area. Broadway Malian designed three buildings for this site and three new public realms. We're standing on the public realm, we're right at the side of the busy strand, the thoroughfare that goes right along what used to be the original waterfront. And the building behind me is a rectangular, very linear building. It was designed for and is occupied mostly by Mersey Travel, has other office accommodation used as well. It's a rectangular building because it follows the line of the strand, of this thoroughfare. But like the other two buildings on this site, the Man Island building here is at the ground level, very open, and you should be able to see through, behind me and beyond, the traffic going along the strand. All of these buildings, the three of them, seem as if they're suspended. They're not as heavy as they seem from a distance. You see the top of them from a distance, but close up, what you see is a building that is almost floating on the ground, almost floating on what used to be a dock. Moving from the very rectangular design of the office building on the Strand, we're looking now at one of the two buildings that are for flats and for offices. Both of them now in full occupation, busy buildings. You can see that they're a very unusual shape. The one that's nearest to us is a wedge shape. It has an angled roof. The roof of the nearest building to us slopes down towards the, the pier head, towards the waterfront. The second building beyond us slopes down towards the river and the Albert Dock, each of them directing the eye towards the two iconic sites full of historical buildings. The apartments within these two buildings all have small balconies, they all open off a central courtyard the atrium in the centre of each building is very attractive and startlingly, the interior of each building is white. The outside black, but the inside white. You approach the apartments through the central atrium, which has been called the equator, and the buildings either side have been given the names of latitude and longitude. The buildings at the tallest point, at the tallest apex, are 13 storeys high. And that apex for each building is visible from all over the city. There are wonderful views of the tops of these two buildings from various parts of the city. And some streets, like James Street, as you're walking down, you're walking towards these angled rooftops. It's a whole new vista for the city. So we've looked at the outside of these buildings and everybody in Liverpool knows them as big, black, shiny buildings. But sadly they haven't all been inside. So coming inside, who would have thought that such a dark exterior could have an interior like this?
So we talked about the three public spaces that Broadway Malian were going to create for this area. We've seen one of them. We're on the second one. And this is a wonderful space. It links beautifully this site, the island site, with the Albert Dock in the distance, the new museum just behind me, the canal link right next to us, and behind me, the waterfront. This public space has been created with cafes, with steps to sit on, hopefully not fall down, with beautiful vistas and a beautiful place for admiring the buildings that the city is so proud of. aspect of this development which I want to talk about is the materials that were used for the cladding of the outside of the buildings. They're black buildings, they're faced with polished black granite and glass. The idea of the black was to reflect the waters of the docks round about which is pitch black. It's also to form a contrast with the white Portland stone of many of the adjacent historic buildings. And it's also, finally and most impressively, to provide reflections. And these buildings, the three of them, all reflect beautifully the surrounding historic buildings. They're almost like a piece of the architectural history of Liverpool encapsulated in these buildings. So we see the pumping station of 1885, a Victorian building. The White Star Building of 1898 with its distinctive red and white stripes, just like Scotland Yard in London, designed by the same architect, Norman Shaw. We see the fine Edwardian Baroque building of the Port Authority Building, 1907. And where we began the very beginning of this programme, the Georgia's Dock Ventilation and Control Station, a marvellous piece of 1930s Art Deco. All of them reflected in this building, which is so very much 21st century. People have come to look upon it a little bit differently. In 2011, when these buildings were completed, the city was a little bit dubious. Here was something very new. It was surrounded by much-loved old buildings. It was in a historic site. People were dubious. In 2015, a few years on, visitors love these buildings. Many photographs have been taken of these reflections. Visitors love the buildings and increasingly Liverpudlians too have come to accept them and in some cases even like them. Mm -hmm.